this week on Waterways. Exploring Big Cypress National Preserve and canal cleanup in the Florida Keys. Wilderness. The word implies an area far removed from civilization and people. But there is a wild place in South Florida where you can experience wilderness up close with very little effort. For the most part, we do live in probably one of the most urbanized areas of the country, whether it be Miami and Fort Lauderdale on the East Coast, or Naples and Fort Myers on the West Coast. But yet, we live in these cities and just the ability to jump in your car and drive out into the middle of the Everglades and be in the largest wilderness area, the largest wild area east of the Mississippi River, I think that that is something that truly provides us a quality of life here in South Florida. If trekking through the river of grass that is the Everglades seems daunting, there is an area connected to the Everglades that is very accessible. That's because Big Cypress National Preserve has two main roads that run right through it. Interstate 75 and U.S. Highway 41, more commonly called the Tamiami Trail, cut right through Big Cypress National Preserve, providing travelers immediate access to one of the most amazing landscapes in South Florida. Big Cypress Swamp is a unique region within the greater Everglades ecosystem and um, it's probably one of the most diverse regions within the greater Everglades ecosystem. Here you might be in a prairie and then walk a hundred yards and be up on a pine land and walk another 50 yards and you might be in a cypress forest. So it's all the same habitats that the Everglades has to the east of us but much more of a patchwork of those habitats. With 729,000 acres of vast swamp, cypress strands, and mangrove forests, Big Cypress National Preserve is home to both tropical and temperate plant communities and a diversity of wildlife, including the elusive Florida panther. While it's typically the Everglades that people think of when they think of the Florida Panther, Big Cypress National Preserve actually has a larger population of these big cats. While black bears and panther sightings are rare for visitors, alligators can easily be seen at either of the preserve's visitor centers. Well, we're at Oasis Visitor Center, and coming from the Miami area to the east, one of the first facilities you'll come across is this visitor center. And at this visitor center, you can get a great deal of general information about uh, activities uh, you can participate in, um, the latest hiking information, biking, off-road vehicle use, and so on. Cypress National Preserve was created in 1974, but it was long considered an integral part of the greater Everglades ecosystem. 
When Everglades National Park was being considered for national park status in the 1920s, many wanted a large portion of the Big Cypress Swamp to be included. After much debate and compromise, the Big Cypress area was removed from what eventually became Everglades National Park. In the 1950s and 60s, it was discovered that the Miami airport was way too small for its current population, and the prospect was that Miami was going to con continue to grow. And so there were a number of development developers that came up with the idea of creating a, a newer, larger airport. Airport construction started in the late 1960s in the middle of the Big Cypress Swamp. Developers wanted to create a central airport with trains and highways connecting the east and west coasts of Florida. The effect of this development would have further blocked the flow of water from Lake Okeechobee into Everglades National Park. Well, there were a lot of people who recognized that Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and others who saw that this was a large connected system, that um, because it was a large connected system, you could not have this large development in the middle of it. So there was a groundswell support to eventually stop this airport and um, protect the area around where they wanted to create this airport. It was with this backdrop that many diverse groups coalesced with the goal of protecting the Big Cypress Swamp. Conservationists, sportsmen, environmentalists, Miccosukees, and Seminoles set aside political and personal differences to achieve their goal. Their efforts culminated in the establishment of the nation's first national preserve. I describe um, the creation of Big Cypress National Preserve as an exercise in compromise. Um, it was a number of people getting together who recognized that the area needed to be protected, but that in order to garner that support for protection, they needed to allow for different uses that were being, um, that were taking place within the area to continue to take place. Unlike a national park, a national preserve allows for a variety of activities and uses not typically permitted in conservation areas. Hunting, oil and gas extraction, operation of off-road vehicles, private land ownership, and traditional use by Miccosukee and Seminole tribes are all allowed in Big Cypress National Preserve. Through careful planning and a tight permitting process, Resource managers have been able to strike a balance between consumptive use and conservation practices. To truly get a feel for the success story that is Big Cypress National Preserve, a camping trip to the backcountry is unparalleled. We have seven different campgrounds as well as the uh, option of backcountry camping. And with all those options, it's really good to get the latest information and, and tips on where to go. And this visitor center is an excellent place to get that information. For those who would like to see what's in the backcountry, but the idea of a day trip or hotel room sounds better than a night sleeping under the stars, elevated boardwalks provide easy access to some spectacular vistas. However, if you're feeling a bit more adventurous or just want to get a closer look at the swamp, there are opportunities to get off the beaten path or the boardwalk. We actually have swamp walks where we, the park rangers, go out with the public so that they can see that it's something that you have to get used to but not something that you have to be completely um, afraid of. You know, you can go walking out in the swamp as long as you're prepared and you know what's happening. What can you see from the boardwalk or on a walk in the swamp? Wild orchids. Alligators. Wading birds. Birds. 
Many of the main attractions that live in the Big Cypress Swamp can be seen just by stopping your car and walking a few steps. With nearly 200 species of birds, Big Cypress National Preserve bird watching is one of the most popular activities for visitors, even for those not into bird watching. During the dry season, when the water levels begin to recede, and really the peak of the dry season around January and February, the preserve is a great place to see concentrations of wading birds, the common egrets and herons, um, but you also see roseate spoonbills, especially during January, February, and March. We even have white pelicans that migrate down here from the northern part of the United States, from around Yellowstone and Minnesota. Uh, and then uh, sandhill cranes we see down here as well. So the best time to see these wading birds taking advantage of the little um, pockets of water where fish are concentrated really begins in January, February, and goes through until about March. We're currently at H.P. Williams Roadside Park, and H.P. Williams is an excellent place to stop uh, while you're driving on 41. Uh, this boardwalk that you see here overlooks a canal which attracts a great deal of wildlife. Uh, wading birds, alligators, deer, uh, a wide variety of, of wildlife. In addition to the variety of wading birds, Big Cypress is considered the world capital of orchids. More than 40 different species of wild orchid call the Big Cypress Swamp home. And most of them are found only in South Florida. The best way to start your adventure in Big Cypress National Preserve is to visit the park website. If you find yourself driving through the preserve on Interstate 75 or State Road 41, stop at a visitor center to talk to someone on staff. They can always provide in-depth information about recreational opportunities. The Welcome Center was uh, opened about 2010 and is an excellent location for getting information, uh, whether you're hiking, biking, camping, uh, pretty much you name the activity, it's an excellent place to get information about those activities. Commercial tours are also available in Big Cypress National Preserve from permitted commercial service operators. Buggy cruising in the swamps, kayaking down the Turner River, freshwater fishing for bass or saltwater fishing for snook. Whether you head out on your own, with a ranger, or on a guided tour, there's no end to the many adventures in Big Cypress National Preserve. On any given day in the winter of 2013, a team of surveyors could be seen traversing the canals of the Florida Keys. Sometimes they appeared to be simply cruising down the middle of the canals, while other times they were taking water samples. To the casual observer, it seemed as if they were collecting information of some sort. Yet to those in the know, this action was a huge step in a 30-year battle for cleaner canals. And it's about 19 feet deep right here. The Florida Keys in the 1950s and 1960s were growing, actually growing. In order to satisfy increasing demand for waterfront property and ocean access, coastal mangroves were cut and canals were dredged. And the dirt from the dredged canals used to build new land for the development of houses and roads. These new canals would forever alter the shape of the Keys and have a serious effect on nearshore water quality. Canals were dug, and canals were dug with 
a little to no uh, concern about the environmental impact uh, that would take place because of the lack of flow, tidal uh, flushing uh, that, that typically takes place in, in natural canals. The major problem with these deep, dead-end canals is there is no water circulation. There are approximately 502 canals in the Keys, comprising a 170-mile network of winding mazes that accumulate oxygen-depriving organic material and other contaminants. For residents of the Florida Keys, a foul-smelling dead-end canal is normal fare. And for many visitors to the Florida Keys, murky and seaweed-laden canals are a far cry from the aquamarine waters promoted in travel magazines. Decades ago, it was common for individuals to see fish and even manatees swimming in their canals. Though today, very few marine animals can survive in these stagnant canals. I've heard stories from doctors who have treated people uh, with uh, viral infections, ear infections, uh, urinary tract infections that they are convinced was caused by swimming in canals with impaired and degraded waters. For decades, cesspits and septic tanks leaked into Keys canals through the porous limestone surrounding ailing sewage systems. The result is that many canals in the Florida Keys do not meet Florida's minimum water quality criteria. Water quality issues involving man-made canals have been evaluated by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, and Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the results of which motivated Monroe County officials to develop the Canal Management Master Plan. One of the first steps in the plan is performing extensive field work to better understand the water quality conditions of every canal in the county. The cleanup of these canals will be the latest in a string of successes in an effort to create healthy waters surrounding the Florida Keys. Historically, the Florida Keys uh, relied uh, 20, 30 years ago on septic tanks and inadequate wastewater treatment systems, as well as stormwater systems. Since then, there have been a lot done, a lot much progress has been made, uh, and a wastewater master plan was implemented. Uh, uh, also, stormwater master plan is being implemented to correct uh, stormwater drainage problems in the Keys. Uh, many, many facilities are being constructed now. Uh, wastewater collection systems are underway. The improvements in wastewater treatment and stormwater management practices are an essential step in cleaning up Keys waters. But they will not solve all the water quality problems that exist in canals. Although many of these problems are linked to wastewater and stormwater discharges, others are due to the physical structure of the canals. At the dead end canals at the end, you're gonna, that's where you're going to find most of your sediment. And then from here, we're using, basically eyeballing the center of the canal and running a profile right down the center. Right here, we're about 21 feet deep at the sediment layer, about 23 feet deep at the rock layer. So we have a separation of about two feet of sediment. Now we got about a foot of sediment. When canals lack circulating water, the organic materials get trapped and decay, causing nutrient enrichment and low dissolved oxygen in the water column. One big concern of elevated nutrient loads and lack of dissolved oxygen in canals is the effect on the surrounding nearshore waters, seagrass beds, and the hard bottom habitat. These efforts have uh, emanated from the Water Quality Protection Program. Uh, of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. That, uh, that program is co-chaired by both the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. But it also includes Monroe County and it includes the municipalities and other state and federal agencies. 
with the canal master plan, the water quality protection program uh, recognize uh, that it's uh, as a priority that requires corrective action. So they uh, created a group called the uh, Canal Restoration Advisory Subcommittee. This group, which includes uh, the county and its consultant, AMEC, have been working to develop a canal management master plan. The canal management master plan will prioritize the water quality problems in all of the Keys canals and provide recommendations for appropriate measures to clean each canal. The Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary helped develop a canal water quality improvement strategy with the following steps. Evaluate and revise the existing hotspot list of water quality problem areas. Inventory and characterize canals, identifying those whose water quality problems are attributable mainly to physical structure, flushing rates, and orientation. Develop and evaluate improvement strategies. Identify and compile a list of water quality improvement technologies. Develop a community education and involvement program. Conduct a canal system restoration pilot project. Implement improvement strategies in canals identified as hotspots. And we will rank which of the canals are the worst. And we're doing it kind of in categories. There's canals that we're going to document, have seaweed problems. Those are going to go in a category themselves, and then we're going to look at the worst ones there. Uh, we're going to look at which ones just have uh, very, very deep zones that need to be addressed. And then with the data we get from the survey crew, we'll be able to say, OK, this one's only 12 feet. That's not as bad as one that's 35 feet. And then um, we're going to look at which ones don't flush. And that's really related to the construction of the canals. And those are going to go in a group by themselves. And the point of this is each one of those impairments has a different restoration technology that's appropriate to, to help clean up that issue. So um, it, part of that database is also going to be what do we recommend for each of those canals. In 2013, Monroe County approved $5 million for canal restoration demonstration projects, which will provide county officials and resource managers with a clear picture of the feasibility, effectiveness, and cost for future restoration planning. Poor water quality in canals, it's definitely uh, of great interest to, to local officials and the residents who want to clean their own backyard and have clean canals to swim in. But it's also of great importance to the tourism economy of the Keys. Uh, the, uh, the canals are the closest water bodies you know, to, to uh, the, the visitors of the Keys. And uh, cleaning up the canals, it's, it's going to uh, uh, definitely help the tourism economy. There are a few ways to accomplish increased circulation and flushing in Keys canals. This includes establishing a second opening in dead-end canals to promote flow-through currents. Another possibility, installing mechanical pumps to improve water quality where channel configuration won't allow flow-through. You know, for, for very, very deep canals, the only solution may be backfilling. Um, for the ones with seaweed, there's a um, seaweed uh, blocker system. It's actually a combination of an air bubble curtain which prevents the seaweed from coming in the canal and a solid framed um, structure that keeps the seaweed out. We may have to do some organic removal if, if we find out that there's a, a very very deep pocket of that seaweed that's just rotting, releasing gases, and we're looking at removing that. Armed with the environmental research provided by Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the Florida DEP, Monroe County officials are now acting on a very complex problem. The next step towards clean canals will rely on participation from the residents. People love to swim in their canals. People love to uh, walk out the front door, back door, and, and swim in their own canal and swim with the fishes and the manatees and, and the sea turtles that, uh, that wind up in, in, in the canals right behind people's houses. The other thing that's really important, improved water quality within these canals is going to improve property values on people's residents. 
Demonstration projects like this, coupled with advances to wastewater and stormwater infrastructure, are helping restore water quality in the Florida Keys, ensuring that our economy and way of life and the marine environment on which they depend will be conserved for the future.